move to the, the trends and what, what the future has in store for us. And the last part is about hugging face, what we do, why we do that, and, and a quick presentation of the, the open source library that we have, which is the, the, main, uh, the main entry point to, to, to what we do. Okay, and then I usually start with quick hands on, but maybe the best is that I, I take your question and then I show you relevant resources uh, related to your question. Okay. So without further introduction, let's go and let's start by, by investigating what is, what is transfer learning. So the traditional way we train a machine learning model is usually by gathering data sets. Then we typically randomly initialize model and we train it from scratch on this data set to get the machine learning system we use for the prediction, okay? And when we have a new task, we usually do this whole process again. We gather new data sets, <clears throat> we randomly initialize a new model, and we train it from scratch again. And the same when we have a, another task, okay? And this is a bit strange because this is not how human learns. We know that we human, we don't uh, randomly initialize our brain from scratch, right? We use all the things we've learned during our life, what we call usually knowledge. We use all that when we start to, when we are faced with a new task, like when we, when somebody asks us to give it, to do a new task, we rely on all the things we've seen and all the tasks we've faced in the past. And this gives us mainly two main advantages. The first one is that we are really data efficient. Like usually a human, you can give him like just a few examples. You can say like one or two example and, and he understand the task. And the second advantage is that uh, we can reach better performances because we can leverage this knowledge to fill in the gap between the training examples that we're given, okay? And transfer learning is one way to try to do that for machine learning model. So last year we gave a, a quite a long tutorial at NACL, a three hours tutorial with, with like 300 slides almost, and a lot of uh, code, code repository, code examples. So you can check out this link if you want to know more. Today, I will just, uh, just do a very fast introduction about, about 15 minutes, okay? So there are many ways you can do transfer learning. And what we will talk about today, which is the most popular way <clears throat> at the current moment is called sequential transfer learning. Sequential transfer learning means that there is a, a sequence of tasks. And that you basically have two tasks, two main tasks. You can have more, but you have at least two to make a sequence. And the first task is called pre-training and is a task which uh, can be very computationally intensive and in which you try to actually reproduce what we've seen on the previous slide, which is to build a knowledge base. So you will take as much data as you can. Uh, for instance, if, you, if your target task is in English, you will gather all the English corpus you have and you will try to train a generic model on that. So by, by generic, I mean, this will be a general purpose model that can then be used in many NLP tasks. So it's trained with an objective, which is typically not the objective you're interested in at the end, not, not exactly the same, but which is a general objective that will help it basically learn how language work. So these are the <clears throat> different general purpose model. You probably have seen some of them if you've, if you've been tackling NLP a little bit. These are words on beddings. Skip thought was RNN, RNN by, by, by LSTM and for a sense. And recently the models are mostly pre-trained transformers. So this used to be just word embedding. So the word embedding is just a vector associated to a word. And now what we use as a, as a general purpose model is a fully pre-trained deep learning model. Okay. So this is the first task. This is the first step, sorry. And the second step is called adaptation. And in these steps, you will actually try to specialize your generic purpose model in the specific task you're interested in. So there are many tasks in NLP. If you're not familiar, here is a, a, few, a few examples. Text classification, one example is that, let's say you have a lot of uh, articles, news articles that you, that you want to classify in articles that are related to politics, articles that are related to sports. So basically you have a list of, uh, of labels and you want to label the text that you have. So this is text classification. Word labeling is also labeling, but at the level of a word. So let's say that now we have a, a news article and we want to label all the, the companies, all the, all the actors in this news article. 
and this is lay word labeling. Question answering is another example. You have a question and you have like a knowledge base, for instance, Wikipedia, or, or the knowledge base can actually be fully contained in your, in your pre-trained models. But in one simple example, you have Wikipedia and the idea is that your model will try to highlight the response. Where is the answer in, in Wikipedia? Okay, this is our example. So let's dive a little bit in the first step. So pre-training. The pre-training step has seen the rise of what we call language modeling. So this is a, an objective to, to train your model. So you will try to, to maximize this or, or to minimize this depending on the, the sign, but yeah, the, you will try to optimize this objective. And language modeling is, a, is quite an, an interesting objective. The idea is that you will try to pre-train, to, to predict the text that you have. So you would take a huge amount of an annotated text, for instance, like the full English Wikipedia, for instance, or, or like a bunch of web page that you've scrapped, and you will try to make the model maximize the probability of this text. So for instance, you take Wikipedia, you mask one word, and the model will try to predict the missing word, try to maximize the probability of the missing word. So you have many ways you can like do this kind of self-training. So the idea here is that you use the training data in an unannotated way. So for instance, you can uh, do denoising, as I told you. You can mask some words in Wikipedia, and the model will be trained to repredict them. Or you can do um, conditional prediction. For instance, you have the beginning of an article, and the model will try to predict the next words. So you have many ways you can formulate or approximate the maximization of the probability of the text. But the very the common thing is that you won't have to annotate this text, which is very useful because it means you can basically use as much text as you want, because there is no cost to, to annotate it. And we all know that on the internet, we have a lot of text, and we have a lot of text in many languages. So basically, in most languages spoken in the world, even low resource languages, you have actually already enough text to really train a high capacity model. So I will show you one example so you can see how really how it works. This is how people train a model like BERT, which is one of the recent transfer learning model in NLP. You take an input sentence, my dog is a good boy. So this is like a typical input sentence that you, that you would find on the internet. And you mask one word. So here the, the verb is, is masked, okay? And the model will try to guess the missing word. So the models are neural networks, so they usually don't, don't take string as input, but we need to convert them. So we have input embedding, which convert the index of the, of the word in the vocabulary in a vector. So this is the vector in the vocabulary. <coughs> and we have a vector associated to each word. But as you can see, these vectors, they are not contextualized. Like the vector associated to a uh, here is not a function of its surrounding. But we would like to we would like it to be a function so that this vector associated to mask here could use the left and the right context to go closer to a vector associated to the mixing to the missing word. Okay. So the way we do that is with attention. So this is the attention mechanism in which we, we do a weighted average of the left and the right context so that the vectors that we get at the end here is a mixture of the left and the right context and can be trained to be close to the missing word here. So once we have these final hidden states here, we project them back on the vocabulary. And we have a training label here, which is the missing, uh, well, not the missing, but the masked word. Okay, here in our case, it was is. And the model is trained so that the final vector here is, the final vector associated to mass token is close to is. So this is one way to train this model. And the nice thing is that to try to guess this mass token, the model will have to learn a lot of things about language. It will have to learn that after like a noun, there is often a verb. It will have to learn uh, like the dog is a singular. So the verb is likely is. So the model is, will just by predicting this mass token, the model will, will learn a lot of things about linguistics that will be useful for basically any task that use language, okay? So there is another way you can train these models, which is called the causal or autoregressive way. And as you can see, it's slightly different. The idea here is that 
one word after one word here we'll try to predict the next word here so like given my dog here we we'll try to predict that the next word is is so as you see we have to change a little bit the attention because if the model is allowed to uh, have a sneak peek at what's on the right it can see the answer so so there is no difficulty to this task so here the model can only use the left context you can see the attention triangles here are different than here okay so this model that we call language model like causal or autoregressive language model they are inherently less powerful because they can't really use the right context okay but the trade-off is that we have a lot of signal here because since um, since we don't use the right context, we can have one label for each token. So as you can see here, we have labels for each token, which means these models, they will typically train faster than this one. Because here, obviously, right, if we if we mask every input token, then we have no not enough context to try to guess them. So there is a trade-off between how much we mask, which give us more signal, and how much we left so that the model can actually solve the task. Okay. So these are the two main kinds of transformers model. And as you can see, they kind of look a lot very similar. And actually, given one of them, we can train the other. Well, if we take one model like this, we can fine tune it to behave like this and vice versa. They're actually quite, quite close in the end. So these are our general purpose model. We've seen how we can train them in a general way, and we end up with pre-trained representation. And now what we would like to do is adapt it for a real task, like a target NLP task. So how do we do that? And we also, we hope that then we will get the two advantages that I, that I was talking about in the beginning, which was the data efficiency, as you remember. We hope that we won't need to, you to have a very large fine tuning um, data set here. And we hope that we will also, also reach high performances because we can leverage this pre-training. Let's see. To adapt the model, it's pretty easy. We just remove the top head here, the, um, uh, the head that was projecting back on the vocabulary. And we replace it by a specific head, which will um, be adapted to our task. So if our task is like just text classification, can be just a, a projection on the, um, on the number of classes that we have. Uh, if the task is quite complex, this top head can be, can be more complex than that. I will give you two examples so you can actually picture really how, how it works and how it looks. So let's start by, by your first example. I will give you two very different examples so you can see that. The first one is text classification. So let's say our task is quite um, simple. This is a bit uh, artificial, but we have input sentences like here, Jim Hansen was a puppeter and our target, our goal is to classify them as true or false. This is like a fact, fact checking, for instance, okay? Um, how, do, how does it work? The first step is called tokenization. And what is the step of tokenization? It's a step during which we, we split here the input string in, in words. But we want to do a little bit more than that. And why do we want to do that? Because these models, they are made to be really used on, on very large corpora, as I told you. They are made to be basically trained on text, which is on the, on the internet. And we know that on the internet, people will use very complex words sometimes, or there will be typos, there will be all sorts of things, which means we can't really have a, a vocabulary which includes all the possible words. This is just not possible. So we could imagine just removing the rare words, but sometimes there's a lot of information in a rare word. Yeah? So another option, which is what people do today, is that when a word is too complex, like puppeter, this word should actually be also in the, in the blue box, when a word is too complex like this, we split it. So here we split it into puppets and er. Er is quite a common suffix. Puppet is quite a common word. So we can have all of these in our vocabulary. And for instance, bird has a vocabulary of 50,000 words about, about it, 50,000 tokens, which are words or subwords. And this is enough to actually process a lot, of, a lot of text. Now, once we have all of them in our vocabulary, we actually uh, just project them 
uh, convert them in integers, which is the, just the number of the word in the vocabulary. And now we have integers, which we can use as inputs to a neural network. So we take the, the model that we saw uh, before, okay, it can be a BERT model or, or a toy aggressive model. And this model, as you remember, will convert each input token in a vector. So here, a, a, a set vector of dimensionality four. In real life, it, it's actually a lot more. For instance, BERT, the dimensionality is 768. And this is the output. This is one vector for each input token. Now, what we would like is to get actually two values. We just want two classes, okay? So we add on top of the model, this is a pre-trained model, we add a classifier model, which will be trained only on the small data set we have for our target task, on the small annotated data set that we have for our target task. But this model can be very small because for instance, if we're doing classification, this model can just consist in uh, pulling all these vectors together to have, a, to have a single vector, for instance, taking the average along the sentence, and then just projecting back from this dimensionality down to the dimensionality of the output space. So for instance, if, the, if it is the output of BERT, we have about 700 dimension here times two classes. So this classifier model can just be a linear projection matrix of 1,400 parameters, which is quite small, right, in deep learning sizes. So this is one uh, text classification model. Now, this is one example that we actually had in the, um, we showed in the, um, in the tutorial I was talking about in the first slide. And this, in this example, we were training, we were fine tuning a model on track six, which is, uh, as the name indicates, a six class classification task. And as you can see, uh, first it go really fast. In just one epoch, after just one epoch, we already are over 90% in accuracy. So this is really data efficient, as you can see. And if we just train it for three epochs, this was on Google Collab, so it took about three minutes. So it's actually really fast, as you can see. We reached an error rate of 3.6, which was the state of the art at that time. So we also had the second advantage that we were talking about, which is high performances. Okay, now let's move to a completely different example. So I have an idea of the wide applicability of this concept. This is chatbot, dialogue generation task. In this specific example, we have a chatbot which has a, a persona. It's this little list and the chatbot is supposed to pretend that he's an artist with four children who got a cat, etc. And you have a dialogue which is going on between the user and the chatbot and the chatbot has to generate the next answer given the dialogue history, the persona and the last utterance he just received from the user. So now you can see there is something strange here. Well, not strange, but there is something different that we have a lot of different type of inputs. We have a little knowledge base here, the persona. We have a dialogue history where we have a list of uterines. We have the recent, the last uterines received and also the reply that we are generating. If we are generating the reply word by word, we need to keep in mind what, the, what word were already generated. So how can we handle many types of inputs while our model was trained on just one input? As you remember, we just had this one input sentence, my dog was a good boy. So yeah, many ways you can do that. The simplest way is just to concatenate all of this, separate it with, uh, with split token if you want, but concatenating all this to make a, an input sequence a single input sequence. And another way is duplicate your model. You can duplicate the pre-trained pre model to have uh, several models that can be used to encode several types of inputs. So you have many ways. We actually have a paper last year at ACL investigating these two methods and comparing them. Uh, but the end result, and this is a competition we participated in with uh, Hugging Face two years ago now at URIPS, well, a, bit, a little bit less uh, than two years ago. And as you can see, this was, a, I think this was the first time that uh, transfer learning was used for, for generative model, that it was used actually for dialogue model. And as you can see, the results were really state of the art. We were like far, far ahead of the, of the competition uh, by leveraging transfer learning. Okay, I showed you a quick overview. And now in this uh, small interlude, before we talk about Hugging Face, I want to show you a little bit the trends and the limits 
in, uh, in NLP. So there's a few trends. If you've been following the field, you've probably heard about one trend, which is that the models are getting bigger, bigger, and bigger. Uh, right now, most of the state of the art modeling research are over 1 billion parameter, which is really, really big because it's, it barely fits in, a, in one GPU memory. Uh, there is uh, GPT-3, which is about 100 billion. Google trained a 600 billion and almost a trillion parameter model. And uh, this is quite a problem for a few reasons. The first one is that when you look at the benchmark, the, the, the official leaderboard that the scientists are competing, um, you can see that all the top rank are taken by just a few teams and just a few companies, basically, just Google, Baidu, Microsoft, Facebook. But there is no university, there is no academia in this. And basically it's really hard for academia to compete because they don't have the resources to train such big models. There's also a question about environmental cost. This training this model and in particular using them in, a, in, the, in the application takes really a lot of um, energetic cost. And we know that consuming energy uh, release uh, carbon dioxide. So there is an environmental question around this model. And more generally, also a question of science. Why, why do we keep scaling them? Do we expect to see some specific phase transition at some point, or is it just to, to, give, to get a little bit uh, better performances on the same benchmark, okay? This is, a, this is a big question. I think Francois Cholet put it quite well when he say, Training even even bigger even bigger uh, convnet on LSTM, but that's also applied to transformers. An ever bigger data set get us closer to strong AI in the same sense that building taller towers get us closer to the moon. So yeah. So at Hanging Face, we've been fighting for the other direction, which is how we can make this model smaller. There is a few options you can try. Uh, first technique is called distillation, which is you take one model that was trained, that was big, and you create a smaller model and you use this, uh, the big model to teach the smaller model how to generalize. And the nice thing that you can, uh, you can have, oh, you can have a model which is about the half of the size of bird, for instance, and which keep most of the performances. So this is very interesting. This model, of course, did still burn. This is, I think, maybe one of the most widely used transformer model today. Um, pruning is a bit different. The idea is that you take the large pre-train model, but instead of training a smaller one uh, on the side, you will actually just remove the weights from the big one. And here you can reach uh, quite a strong sparsity regimes where you have just a few percent or even less than 1% of the weights remaining. This is very nice work by, uh, by Victor San. And you just have a little bit of weights remaining, but they are enough to keep you uh, very strong performances or very good performances. And the last option is to do quantization. In quantization, you will just change the weights from, float, from full precision floats down to integers. And this also reduces quite strongly the size of the model. You can see here that you, you go, you have about a four, four times reduction easily. Now these models, they also have another problem, which is called generalization problem. So generalization uh, is the problem that as soon as you leave the training distribution or the fine tuning distribution, your model can fail in, a, in unexpected ways. So you have two, two problems, mainly the, the one is one is called brittleness, the other one is called spuriousness. They are slightly different. So I just explain you a little bit what they mean. Brittleness means that if you change a little bit the inputs, this model will totally fail, even if the meaning is the same. So here, for instance, it's a question answering model where you have a question, you have a, a paragraph, in which the answer is supposed to be. It's like a Wikipedia page, if you want. And the model is supposed to, to find the answer in the paragraph. And just by adding like a sentence, a little bit distracting at the end, the model will just totally fail. So this is brittleness. And this is unexpected because humans don't fail like that. And spuriousness is slightly different. Spuriousness is 
If you have an easy way to solve your task in your data set, for instance, you have like class imbalance. One class is more, is more, uh, is more often uh, right than the other, or you have some easy surface uh, heuristics, then the model will very quickly catch them. So let me give you one example here. Given two sentences, you try to classify if they are contradiction or entailment or they are neutral. They have, these two sentences have no relation. And in this widely used training data set called uh, MNLI, you have one of these bias, which is that if the sentence, if the sentences have a lot of lexical overlap, you have a lot of words in common, then usually it means there is entailment. But it's easy to build two sentences with a lot of words in common that are contradiction. Uh, here is one example on the top. The first sentence can be, for instance, the doctor was paid by the actor. Okay, the doctor was paid by the actor. And the second sentence can be, for instance, the doctor paid the actor. So the, the was is meaning, but this fully changed the meaning. Okay, In the first case, it's the actor which pay. In the second case, it's the doctor who is paying. So the, these two sentences, they are contradiction. But because the lexical overlap is strong and because in the training data set, we have this bias, this artifact that when there is a lot of your, uh, when there is a lot of overlap, we have an uh, entailment, then the model will always predict entailment. And this is what we call spuriousness, that the model, they quickly catch this very easy um, to, to find artifact or biases that we don't want them actually to learn. Now, if we take a step back, there are also more general problem with the fact on training on text alone, because there's a lot of things we just don't say in texts. This is called a um, human reporting bias. And it say that basically we don't write the obvious because everybody knows about it and that's just not interesting. So what we write about is the not obvious. But that means that a lot, there's a lot of obvious things that are just basically barely found on the internet. So I usually take the, the example of, of a sheep, like the, the animal. We talk a lot about black sheep, but we don't talk a lot about white sheep because when you ask the color of the sheep, just everybody knows it's, it's mostly white, it's mostly white, right? That's like common knowledge. So when you take a very large, uh, even a very large model like GPT-2 or GPT-3 and you ask it, what is the color of a sheep? Then it's a bit lost because it's in its training data set more often, like a lot more often, it's black and not white. And so this is a limitation and this is quite fundamental to the way humans are using text, which is that uh, we're using it to explain the interesting thing that happened, not the boring one. And when you want to overcome that, uh, the most logical way is actually to leave text alone and to try to add some other modalities. So one way could be to add a databases, a database where you will connect sheep with color white. Another way would be to use images where you could see that the animals are white. And the last way is to use, for instance, a, a human in the loop that will say, no, you're wrong, deep learning model. Sheep are not black, they're white. Well, I know some sheep are black, but this is quite the exception. And that's why actually black sheep is the exception. Okay, so, but you need to leave text if you want to do that. And the very last, and this is my last slide on the trend on limits, is called continual and meta learning. The, the idea here is that we usually train this model once, it can be very expensive to, to pre train this to general purpose model. For instance, GPT 3, the last model by OpenAI, costed uh, uh, between six and $10 million to train. But it was trained just before COVID, just like a few months before. And so it has actually just no idea what COVID is, which is very stupid. Well, which is a shame because COVID is just a, a strong um, element in our life today, right? We should be able to add this new piece of knowledge. But it's very difficult to add new piece of knowledge to these models because of the phenomenon called catastrophic forgetting, which is if you want to try to add, if you try to add some new piece of knowledge, usually it forgets a lot of other things. And it's hard to keep everything in, in the memory of the model. So this is a very open question here, but I think it's a very important one. Now we finished about the science park. 
the science part and I, I want to move to Hugging Face and our open source tool. Should I take some question now? Or maybe it's better if I keep them for the end. Uh, let me just check if you have it. Uh, <clears throat> I see we have a few questions. Uh, maybe yeah. if you... Yeah, now is a good time. Them. I can't see them actually. Um, maybe I should... Um... Uh, just click the Q&A tab. Yeah. It's probably open somewhere else. No. Oops, okay. Maybe I can move this here. Okay, yeah, I can see the question. Okay, uh, will we get the slides? Yes. Um, Tiago asked uh, maybe too early on the presentation, but from the first start, chart one would assume that there is a way to train and maintain a custom model without the full copra you just need to add corpus delta and retrain then trust the delta um yeah it's possible to retrain the model but when you when it costs 10 million to train your model <laughs> you you would like to find the cheapest way to add pieces of knowledge just a bit like humans right when we add new knowledge we don't start from scratch again we just manage to just managed to find some place to add the new knowledge. So there is a few models which, which can do that. I can show you a bit at the end if you want. There are models which are like what we call, what I, at least I call hybrid model with, with like um, some kind of database uh, that can be updated. But it's, it's a very uh, actual thing and, and not a lot of people have been working on this yet. Well, I mean, at least in the context of transfer learning on very large pre-trained models. Um, but yeah, it's a very, it's a very interesting question. Uh, can you describe a workflow to mask text components? Um, yeah, to mask text, there is, a, there is actually a few possibilities. Uh, the simplest one is just to randomly sample the, 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 the word you want to mask. Uh, but some people have been doing a smarter thing and have been trying to mask, for instance, just the part of a sentence, just like expression, for instance or like uh, sentences and it, it can give better performances. This is also a direction today that people are trying to optimize a little bit the way they mask and denoise. So it's a very good question. There is some models like Orca or Pegasus. So I can give you some links if you want to read papers on that, but there is a lot of people trying to investigate how we can do that better. Um, what are the visualization tools? Ask Arish, what are the visualization tools to see patterns in entities that you get out of NLP models? Hmm, this I don't really know. I can uh, give you, a, I will give you at the end a link to our forum, which is an open forum uh, by Huggy Face where there is a lot of people and you can maybe ask this with more details and some, some people maybe know. Maybe too. Why has it been harder to do transfer learning in NLP compared to images? That's a good question because you're totally right. Um, it started in, um, in computer vision and uh, now it's in NLP. I think one of the main reasons is that uh, in NLP, you actually you need a very, very large corpora to, to start to see some strong and consistent benefits from using transfer learning. This is why also these models are actually very expensive to train. So if you don't scale to big enough corpora, you don't really see a, a strong enough effects, basically. So it's not really harder, but it, it's definitely, it was more computationally intensive for some reason. Can we compare as of today, the transformer approach with a classical AI, all the approach like grammars and predicate? Yeah, we can on some, on some benchmark and usually it, it works better because it's more, it's more flexible and it can be trained on a, on a wider uh, vocabulary and like more open domain data, which means it's more robust to, to small changes in the inputs. But on the other end, it's less robust on some stuff. Like what I showed you, this brittleness thing, this you see them less with grammar, uh, but grammar, they are less usually robust to extending to out of domain data. Yeah. So there is a trade-off. Can you use dialogue to further train a model? Yes, for a long time it didn't work, but recently it has started to work. So people call that reinforcement learning. 
where you have a feedback, you have a feedback from a user on the output of the model during training. Or sometimes we call that human in the loop. There is two main results uh, this year that I've seen, one from um, Facebook New York, from the group of J Jason Weston, who has been uh, very, for, for a very long time experimenting with chatbots and interaction with humans. And another one, which was the summarization results, um, I think it was about by OpenAI. So I can give you some links or, or you can the same. I will give you the, the link to our forum where, where I'm usually, so you can ask again this question and give you the pointers. Uh, answer last one and then I move on. Uh, the COVID example on GPT-3, it's not possible to add new layers with the COVID details while maintaining the uh, past information. Yeah, no, it's not possible. That's the point of transfer learning. Not really. Transfer learning is like a, is more like a reducing. So transfer learning, you start from a model that should have everything. And then you actually filter out to keep only the thing that you need for your task. But transfer learning does not solve the other problem, which is starting from a small model and like increasing the, the sizes. Transfer learning, do it this way. You start from a model which is trained on the huge corpus. So you, you hope this model will have just everything. And then you filter out basically just what you don't need and you keep what you need for, for your target task, okay? But if your target task is as wider scope than the input, then you're, then you're trashed, it doesn't work. It's not, the, it's, not the, it's not the solution to your problem. Okay, I can answer the last one. Um, uh, where you, uh -huh. How many of the corporate model noted are under patent lock? I think none of them, yeah. Do we risk wall garden around the best model? Yeah, uh, I don't think so. But to be honest, the legal status of a train model is quite blurry right now. There's nobody really knows if it if it falls under the umbrella of uh, like a copyright law. Like some of these models, like GPT three or, or this generative model, can be used to actually regenerate some corpora. So this caused the question. This caused the this opened the question of do they contain copyrighted information? Some of these models just cannot be used to generate cop copyrighted data. Like bird, for instance, cannot be used for that. So it's a lot harder to claim that they can be uh, a way of, um, of sharing copyrighted data. Okay, yeah, I think I'll move and then we will take the rest of the question after. So what we do at Huggy Face, you can still see my slide, huh? Um, Huggy Face has one main goal, which is democratizing NLP in the sense that we try to make it, all these new tools more accessible to everybody. Uh, we have a core research goal. We also have a research problem, which is trying to understand AI and uh, in particular, the notion of creativity, adaptability, interaction in AI. And we actually started as a chatbot company with a product that was rather, rather successful, about a few million users. And uh, while we were developing this product, which was a, a chatbot, a game, we actually started to open source some tools we were building. And these tools caught so much interest from the, from the community that after about one year, we were fully, fully uh, working on the tools. And so we decided to, to actually move the focus of the company to this open source tool and uh, to just try to accelerate just the work of everybody. And we were like, okay, if we catalyze the research in NLP, this will actually solve our original goal of solving chatbots for, for games. So um, we decided to do this full, this full time democratization and, and, and sharing. And we do that basically in two ways. Uh, the first way is called uh, knowledge sharing. This is why I'm here today to talk with you. And this involves trying to communicate this latest research, this latest breakthrough in AI. We try to educate people about them. We try to share the, the share the great news of this new of these new models and this new way to use them. So we are, I organize a lot of tutorials in big uh, in big NLP conferences. We organize workshop. We try to push also for uh, the good direction in our opinion. For instance, we try to push for smaller models try to push people to make models that works better. So for instance, in a, in, a, in a workshop that was just last week, we had a competition on trying to make these models more efficient. 
so we do a lot of things like this. And the other aspect is about sharing codes and sharing models. So we are trying to build what could be seen as the GitHub of, uh, of model sharing uh, in some way, which is just a way where everybody can access this pre-trained representation in a very simple way, in a very efficient way, and also in a way that enable the community to collaborate. So we try to do open sourcing the right way, which is for me somewhere between the fully researched code, which is nice for researchers, but which uh, involves uh, a lot of uh, tweaking if you want to adapt it to your use case. And what I call sometimes the fully production code, which is very efficient in terms of number of lines you have to write, but sometimes is not flexible enough for researchers because they want to change it too much for, for what is allowed. And so we try to find the right balance between these two extremes. And also at the same time to break all the barriers that we see between the frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Google, Facebook, and also be between the communities like the research and the practitioner community. We're all basically working toward the same task in NLP. So we should be able to almost use the same tools. That's our opinion. And this way we think that we can enable people to basically use faster and more efficiently and modify and improve more efficiently the, the things that other teams have developed. So we've been basically open sourcing three main libraries that, that I will now quickly present to you. The first one, which is one of uh, the, the, the most famous one is called Transformers. Transformers is a library to give you access to state-of-the-art models and also an access that enable you to understand and to modify these models. They are not black box. They are very open box that you can tweak uh, and that you can read to know how they work and that you can use in your task. So it's designed to be for everyone, very easy to use with just a few, um, a few abstraction to learn. And it's designed to um, give you state-of-the-art performances, basically. We have a lot of models. This is actually already out of date. I updated one no, two weeks ago. Uh, we have a lot of architecture uh, that, that are added by, new, by us or by the researchers. There is all the, the most famous one that, that I've been talking about and you've probably heard about, which is BERT and the GPT family from OpenAI. We also have multilingual model like XLM. Uh, we have smaller model like Distilled Bird. I talked about it this this uh, earlier, a few few slides earlier. We have uh, this is also a more efficient model. We have very big model like T5 is a 11, 11 billion parameter model. We have a few multilingual model, uh, multimodal, sorry, uh, image and text, MMBT, Elix Mert is uh, not on this list. I think it's probably number 25 now. Um, we have dialogues model. Uh, reform a more efficient model for longer sequences. So a lot of different models and all of them can be used with the same API and basically uh, just uh, by changing just the name of the model in your code. The abstraction are very simple. They follow what I've explained to you. There is a tokenizer to convert the strings in integers that the model can digest. And then there is the model, which is just the forward pass of a deep neural network. Okay, using load in the model and using them is about five lines of code like this. We now have a, so this is open source at GitHub. And now we have a model hub in which people can share their model. I think there is over 4,000 models right now. There are models in many languages, as you can see here in English, Spanish, French, Chinese, Turkish, uh, more than 200 languages, I think. And these models, you can click on them, you can explore. Uh, there is um, a readme usually, it's like a GitHub, so people can add a model card where they explain how the model was trained. And you can actually play with them as well. They are live and they are all plugged on a, on a, on a CPU or GPU backend, and you can try them live to see how they behave. So all this, all this stuff are at uh, huggingface.co. This is open source, open access. You can just click and you can see the list of the model directly. We can go there together a bit later if you want. So this is the first library called Transformers. Now we identified one bottleneck in the deep learning pipeline, which is the tokenization. Tokenization is often quite slow. This is this step of converting strings in integers. And um, as I told you, we, we have to split these words. There is a lot of for loops to do that. And basically Python and for loops are not very good friends. And so it's very slow. And so we decided to recode to Re, redo the, the main 
uh, algorithm to split words in, in a fast language is called Rust. Rust is a low level language, which is both very safe, but also very fast. And so you can now encode one gigabyte of text in about 20 seconds, which should be uh, fast for everyone. Um, it's available in Python, Node.js, Rust, and it's also integrated in, uh, in Transformers. And just before the summer, we've been open sourcing a, a new library, which is called Datasets, which is a library to give you very simple access to all the data sets in NLP and also uh, all the metrics. So this was something that I, I, th I thought was too complex to access this open source data set. They are there, but you have to reprocess them all the time in the same way. And also they are all spread around in various GitHub repository of Dropbox, something like that. So we thought maybe it would be good to have like in the same way that we've gathered the models in transformers to gather the data set in data sets. So that's what we've done. There is now uh, about 200 data sets, but we, we will reach 500 uh, very soon because we it's actually increasing really, really fast. And there is a built-in interoperability with many frameworks. As always, we, we kind of framework agnostics. You can use the library with NumPy, Pandas, PyTorch, TensorFlow 2. It's very fast. And we made a special thing because we were using a lot of very large data set. I, I told you, you try to train on terabytes of, uh, of of, Wik of uh, Wikipedia, for instance. And it's sometimes it's a bit annoying because this doesn't even fit in your RAM memory, right? But we thought this is a bit stupid. Maybe we could find a way to just memory map that on drive and we, and we find a nice way using a, a very efficient serialization protocol called Apache Arrow, which do zero, zero cost serialization. So you can now train with this library on, on a data set of arbitrary size, as long as it fits on your hard drive, but usually hard drive, you have a lot of, a lot of, of space. So this enabled us to, to scale to terabytes or even more of data without, without any problem and actually do that even on a laptop, for instance. I can train on one terabyte on, one, on, on my MacBook here, which is very nice. Um, and it's made to be very fast. There is a lot of uh, smart caching there and yeah, it's a very nice library, I think. And it's also very simple to use as always. So you just import load data set. Uh, yeah, it was called NLP uh, first, but then we expanded to a uh, data set be behind the NLP. So now it's called data set. There is also images some in this library. And loading a data set is just about typing load data set and you type the name of your data, the name of uh, one of the few hundreds data set that are there. And you just load it. And for instance, tokenizing the data set is these three lines here. And this is basically the full pre-processing text to prepare um, a data loader. If you know PyTorch, this is the standard data loader of PyTorch. Uh, I told you this library integrates with, with PyTorch, TensorFlow, NumPy very easily. So you can just load this in the data loader and you have your data set um, ready for training in about, this is 15 lines of code maybe, maybe less, there is a lot of comments. And we also have a data set hub the same way. Uh, all these data sets are accessible. You have a, a readme card to understand what's, what's inside and you can even explore them. You can click on browse here and you can navigate all these all this data set here. So we are working on that very actively. Actually next year we plan to, next week, sorry, we plan to add about 300 more data set to the library. Our goal is really that this should cover a very wide spectrum of data sets and tasks. It already does, but we want to double or triple the size of this in the, in the coming weeks. So check it out. It's also at huggingface.co and the library is, is on GitHub. And this concludes the tools that we have. So I can take now the rest of the question if you want. Um, And if some of you want to uh, ask your question with, with your voice, I think it's also probably possible. Uh, okay, let's take me a few of them. I'll try to go fast so I can answer as much as I can. Uh, but maybe just one thing actually uh, to show you if you can, yeah. Let me, let me try to just share you because I want now to show you maybe some actual resources and links related to what you say. And so the first link I want to show you, can you, can you still see my uh, screen? Yeah. 
Ethica. And the first thing I want to show you is, uh, up, is discuss.huggingface.co. Yeah, maybe just, I want to show you, just go to huggingface.co. And here you have actually everything you, you, you might want to need. In this uh, menu here, which is a little bit hidden, can you see the hangingface.co here? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah, okay. So here we have a forum now, um, which is very active. And I'm also there uh, often. I try to be there at least once, one per day. So here you can ask a lot of questions. Don't hesitate, you can ping me. So if I didn't have time to answer your question here, just go to the forum. You make a new topic. You have topic for beginners, so you don't have to be shy. And you can ask very question about research, question just beginner is everything. But if you have specific question about the libraries, you can also post there. But yeah, just go there. That's the place if I didn't have time to uh, answer your question. And a few other things here. And uh, the documentation about all the, all the libraries is here. Uh, Transformer has all our library has have usually a, a quick tour, which will walk you very quickly through the main uh, feature of the library. So this is a good place to start exploring uh, our libraries. Okay, the quick tour. This is a quick tour for Transformer. If you go for the data sets library, there is also here a quick tour, which will quickly walk you, you through uh, getting data set, processing it, and training a deep learning model on it. You even have the training loop in PyTorch here. So yeah, this is the documentation and the forum. These are the two places to save you if you're lost. And uh, yeah, this is the model hub here with all the models. Uh, but then, yeah, I'll show you that. And the blog is also a nice place if you want to read a bit more. We write blog and usually we try to make them really cool with demo. So let me just show you one cool demo before I dive in the question, which is the zero shot classification. So can you do classification without even fine tuning? Yes, you can. Um, this is a bit magical, but you can just write the name of the classes you want to classify. So let's say you have some text as input. And let's say we want to classify this text, uh, whether it's about uh, politics, whether it's about uh, music, uh, whether it's about uh, a city, or whether it's about animals. And the text is, who are you voting for in 2020? Yeah. And we can live do what we call zero shot because there is no training example here. Yeah, I just designed, I just decided the topics just right now. And the model can classify them. What are you voting for? I think it's more about politics. Uh, but I can ask another question. Huh? Uh, let's say uh, animals. Um, do you like uh, rabbits? And up. And the model thinks it's about animals. Okay, so this is the worst topic classification. And if you think it's interesting, uh, there is an associated blog post where Joe Dav, this is a member of our science team, Joe, Joe Davidson, you can follow him on Twitter as well. He's very active. And he explained how does this work? Where does it come from? How you can actually train your model to do that if you want to do it yourself and everything. Okay, so there's a lot of cool demo like this. Uh, we have other for like, we were talking about continual learning. We have a demo about continual learning. Uh, but to see this, just go to uh, Huggy Face and explore a little bit our blog post. Okay, now I'll take the question because otherwise I just won't have time. But remember, if, you, if I don't have time, just go on the forum. So Sven asks, you mentioned black sheep model, the problem and sentence getting opposite meaning when using single word. Are there any recent approach trying to cope with this problem or are they fundamentally in a way that you do not expect to be able to cope with those? Um, yeah, these are big problems, but uh, like all the big problems, people are actually trying to solve them. It's very difficult, huh? but uh, people are trying to do that. So uh, I highlighted this a little bit in my video, in my slides. I, will, uh, I can post the, the, the link to the slides. Um, one way to try to solve them is to try to go out to using other modalities. So I posted here a few papers that you can have a look. Uh, more recently, uh, there was a, a very nice paper called uh, Vocalization, which is a multimodal uh, paper that, that worked quite well as well. Uh, vulcanization. If you take type in vulcanization, there was actually a meat review uh, article on it. 
Um, yeah, if you go on the mid technology review, they did, um, yeah, they do a lot of things. So I don't know if I, if I found it, but yeah, but, um, yeah, if you, you can ping me on the forum and I can send it to you. Uh, but yeah, some people are trying to solve this. And I think one of the most interesting way to try to solve this is to do uh, multimodality. I think that's the most uh, interesting way. But there, yeah, there are many options. So you can check in my slide or you can uh, try to read the MIGTEC review and find the vocalization paper by Hao and, um, and Moit Benzal. Uh, Kirin, uh, today most NLP problems seems to, about, seems to be about calibration of models rather than models themselves. Do you think that the pre-birth area is a dead end for research now? No, I don't think so. I think it's very, it's still very interesting in that uh, linguistic was a very big part. And I, I'm very confident in the fact that linguistics today is probably the way for uh, us to go further in how we evaluate how our model works and how they fail and why they fail. So there is a revival of linguistic right now, I think. Uh, but I mean, when I reach right now, it's like really recent, like a few months to one year ago, where people understand that's probably the way to understand the failure of these models is actually to go back to um, pre-deep learning era and, and in particular to use that, not really to design model, but to use that to probe models better, to use that to probe the phenomenon where models are failing to understand their failures. Warren asked, how did we come up with the name Hugging Face? Oh yeah, that was a bit of a joke. So, um, so as I told you early, we were actually a game, more, more like a game company. And so uh, the game was used mainly by, by millennials, uh, like teenagers and 20 people in their 20s. And so we wanted something fun, uh, a fun name. And we also thought that it would be nice if one day we have a very big uh, company that we have like an emoji as, a, as the logo, like something a bit not serious. Now, <laughs> now today we are doing very serious stuff. So the name is a bit a uh, joke, but I think it's still a nice name. If I want to add features other than the word embeddings, the place to do it is where we add the task specific head at the top of the model. Yeah, that's actually a very uh, wide question, uh, Lapid, and uh, it depends. Some people try to add it in the in the input, trying to um, to add the feature as new tokens, for instance, or as new way to formulate the inputs. And some people try to add it at the end. So the two options can work. Yeah. So uh, if you want to know, you have to dive really in the in the specific use case you try to do to understand what is the best. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a yes or no great answer. This depends. Kai say, can you describe what a sentence level model looks like? Do you mask a full sentence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a model which is called SpanBird. SpanBird, uh, which was uh, now oh, everybody do like that. Uh, oh yeah, it was a Facebook. Yeah, so SpanBird is the first model who tried to do that. And they and they try to. It was a very nice paper by 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 a very cool team. Um, and maybe they have a, maybe they have an illustration where we see a little bit. Yeah, you can see. So here you can see. Uh, they they mask like full sentence, and they use the token at both ends to try to help the model to guess what was missing. And what they show is that it works better this way. Actually, the model, they are more robust when you mask full sentence rather than just one word because it's a bit harder and it helped them learn a bit more about English. Eric say, do some model work better on different languages? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so the models, they, they have, um, if I go back to huggingface.co, uh, something interesting for you is probably also the languages pages, which lists all the languages that we have modeled for. So you can see there's a lot of them and some are pretty rare. And well, for some of them, we also have just not a lot of models. Huh? Um, well, we have models for almost every language is in the ISO, uh, ISO classification. Um, but yeah, some models are definitely different and you need a model which is trained for them. So. You have a few multimodal models uh, like this one. And these models uh, like BERT, multilingual, for instance, they are trained on 
several languages at the same time. So BERT Multilingual, for instance, is trained on a, about a hundred different languages. Um, and so it can handle all these languages at the same time. So some models are naturally multilingual because they have been trained on the, at the same time on several model, on several languages, but some of them are just monolingual. In this case, you want to, to select the one that knows the language uh, that you're working on. Yeah. Do we provide- uh, Hey, Thomas, uh, sorry uh, to interrupt. Uh, yeah, uh, would you mind to post the previous, you show the paper, would you mind to post the link to the chat so we can- yeah, uh, sure. Uh, uh, click it. And also the website, the one you are showing right now, I think the huggingface.co uh, is a website. You also can post, uh, just uh, copy yeah. paste to the to the chat. Let me, yeah, we are, we are about the end. So let me post links now to everything. Yeah, discuss okay. exactly. Good, good thing, yeah. So huggingface.co is the, is the main Yeah, that'd be great. And uh, I see we have quite a lot of questions and I don't think we have enough time to answer all of them. Uh, yeah. We have two, uh, a few folks raising hand. Uh, I guess uh, they want to uh, speak to us questions. Uh, maybe I can give them a chance to uh, let them to speak, uh, ask questions. Definitely. Okay, hi, uh, is it Sophia? Um, I unmute you. Uh, you, if you have questions, you can you can ask. Please go ahead. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Oh hi, you have my voice. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, uh, in dialogue generation, does it help uh, and make the process faster or uh, better if we use a uh, text classification, if we combine text classification algorithm with uh, dialect generation. So before generate, uh, so, so that it could uh, have a better idea of what it's gonna generate because the model this way uh, can know the classification of the text. Yeah. So you remember, maybe I showed you the, the, the competition we participated in uh, at NeurIPS. And we were actually doing that. So I can just post you a link to uh, to, uh, to my paper. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me let me post a link to that. That was a short paper, uh, transfer transfer. Yep, there you go. And you can have a, a, a link. There is also a, a repository with the code. I think it's probably in the paper. Um, yep. So now there, there have been other people that, that was probably the first paper doing this uh, transfer learning generation. But now if you look at the paper citing it, uh, you will find more recent paper who are doing the, the same, uh, who are doing more, more recent thing about this, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, great. Uh, maybe we can go back to the Q&A, take a, a couple more, the last okay. two questions. Okay, so this one, um, some of that, yeah, was okay. Consulting, we do a little bit, um, uh, but uh, not not a lot. Yeah, and partnership we do, but mainly with mainly with very very big like. Uh, but you can reach out. Uh, you can reach out uh, to explain more, uh, Harry. Uh, if you go on our website, there is a there is a place to to reach out. Um, Urvashi, even humans can store, uh, cannot store all information, yeah, forever. Uh, yeah, no, we don't really, well, yeah, do we ask the model to remember everything? That's a good question, right? Because we don't do that as human, but in some way we would like our, our, our computer to be a little bit better, I think, than what we do. Uh, we we kind of like that, uh, that Wikipedia can store every knowledge and we would like the model to actually be, be able to to complete the thing that we cannot do, complement us more than just to replace. So I think on, in my hand, we, in my opinion, we should, we should try, but maybe there is fundamental limits that, that make it just not possible. That's, that's possible, yeah. And René, how would you identify if a model is of good of a high quality? Yeah, there is a, 
there is evaluation metrics. So this is actually what we are also adding in the, in the data set library that I was talking about. Um, you want to have a good metric that is good for your task. So if you do generation, uh, the metrics can be, uh, well, there's a lot of metrics, actually it's a bad choice, but if you classification, you can do like F1 or accuracy or something like that on a, on a validation data set. If you do generation, it's a bit more blurry, but there is some interesting new metrics like blurt or blue score that are, that are nice for, for generation. Okay, and I think I've reached uh, most of the end. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, well, that was yeah, nice. I think that, yeah, okay. go ahead. Sorry. No, yeah, I think I think I'm good, and then the rest, uh, the, just don't hesitate to ask on the forum. I think it's it's probably better, right? Sure, sure. Great. Well, uh, well, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Thomas, for the great presentations and a lot of questions discussing. That's uh, uh, really uh, really great. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. And uh, we are uh, unfortunately we are uh, 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 over times. So uh, as uh, Thomas said, you know, if you have uh, more questions, uh, please go to the uh, discussion uh, on the hugging face uh, uh, to get uh, uh, more conversations going. Um, the, with that, it concludes today's uh, talk. And uh, thanks again for uh, everyone joining us today. I uh, hope to see you again in our next event. Uh, please go to the website to uh, check our uh, upcoming events uh, pretty much in every day. Um, so hope to see you again next time. Thanks a lot, everyone. It was very, very nice. The, the Q&A session was really great. Thanks for the great question. Yeah. Bye-bye. Great. Thanks. Bye-bye. Oh, by the way, for the slides, uh, are you uh, able to send to me or you can send yeah, a link? Uh, yeah, actually, I posted all of that in the in the chat, but then it is okay. Great, great, great. So great. Uh, maybe you want to save the chat, or I don't know. Yes, yes, the, uh, we will save the chat. Yeah, you know, but just send me an email, otherwise, and I can give you all the links again. And uh, yeah, don't hesitate. Okay, great. Okay, bye. Okay, bye, -bye.